Welcome to the Tool Hut channel. Tonight we have a special guest, Samuel Bain from Detailed Auto Diagnostics. Stand by. Welcome to the Tool Hut Car Flasher channel. Today we have a special guest, Samuel Bain from New Jersey. So Sam, why don't you introduce yourself? Kind of tell everybody where you're from and what you do and how you got there. Okay, as uh, Mr. Brooks said, um, Sam from South Jersey. Um, been doing the mobile thing for about three years. Never saw myself doing the mobile thing ever. Didn't even know there was such a thing as mobile. Um, started off with my first introduction to automotive in high school, like a lot of people. Um, ventured off from high school. I went to the military and that's where I got my hands on training. Um, Worked on a lot of trailers, water bulls, Humvees, things like that. So obviously when I was finished in the military, I said, well, I have a trade. I might as well go do this in the civilian world. And, um, and that's how it all happened. Well, I found out very quickly that uh, automotive repair business isn't all sunshine and rainbows, particularly in the civilian world. So, uh, after a few years getting dirty, I said, enough is enough. Um, I need to do something different. And I did for quite some time, but I always did this on the side. I know a lot of people are like, ah, why are some guys doing it on the side? Just go to a shop. But I did it on the side and it kept me in the know and, and it kept me fresh and sharp. That way I didn't feel like I left it a hundred percent. Um, then when I got tired of that job, I said, you know what? I'm going to go back to wrenching. And I still had all my tools that I kept in storage. Um, I had to get, you know, a couple more recent tools for vehicles that were new released or whatever, and jobs that required modern day tools. And I did that um, for a while. And I opened up my own shop. I had my own shop for a few years. And then it was proposed to me that I should just get a job to where I could see what it felt like to get paid and not have to worry about paying everything else first. I could just take that money and pay what I wanted to pay instead of paying the lease and paying the, the uh, business insurance and the internet and, and our service information and all those things. I said, you know what? I'll try it out. So I went to work for somebody and after about, well, I knew it probably after about six months, but after about two and a half years, I said, I can't work for anybody anymore. I got to go do this on my own. So what can I do immediately and not have to tow a huge snap on toolbox around? I said, huh, I've heard about this mobile thing. Let me try that. That might work. And um, <laughs> so, so here I am, um, a lot of classes, a lot of training along the way. I know that the description was rudimentary, but um, there are a lot more details, but you get the general idea. Walk the same path as a lot of people. Um, a lot of growing pains in this business, but with that, you get rewarded with your knowledge and your experience, and and eventually you get over the hump. Now, you never stop learning, but eventually you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, so... Uh are you still in the same car you started with? When it comes to mobile, yes. Yes, I am in the exact same vehicle that I started with. And um, I need to get a van. And you have encouraged me to get a van. Everybody encourages me to get a van because if you're mobile, you'll struggle for a while. But eventually, you're going to be forced to get a bigger vehicle because going home each evening and unloading and reloading and deciding on which tools you need for the following day that gets old real fast. Yeah. Yeah. I drove a, uh, and I've told you this before, but I drove a 2007 HHR that I bought that had 180,000 miles on it. And, uh, when I bought it, I figured if I could get a year out of it, I'd be doing pretty good. And I drove that car for almost six years. Wow. And I had 445,000 miles on it when I sold it. Amazing. So, yeah, I know I know what it's like to 
get used to a car and used to a certain way of doing things. And and it, uh, when I was at Bosch, we had our own cars, and I had a 2000 Impala that I kept all my equipment in for uh, sales. And when I got my company car, I gave that car to my son. It had 530,000 miles on it. So oh my goodness, wow! I ran that car to the to the ground. Awesome. So, yeah, so I didn't mention that oh, yeah. my car, my car is a 2018 Kia Soul. Um, they actually are a lot bigger than I thought. I increased the size by removing the front passenger seat, and that's what the camera is sitting the sitting on a shelf that I made and bolted in place of the seat. So I got a three tier shelf that uh, holds laptops, and that's bolted in place of the seat. I got both seats down in the back. And I don't know if I'm able to, but just a quick glimpse. And it's kind of dark back there, but there's my photo away card. And back there is all the fun. And <laughs> I know it's not the best view, but um, in front of in front of the shelf that the camera is sitting on on the floor, uh, passenger floorboard, I have my inverter mounted to a carpeted piece of wood um that way all the laptops that sit on this shelf can charge as i'm traveling because it's not one of the worst things you can do is show up for a job and have a laptop that has a dead battery so yeah so what's what's something that you kind of wish shops understood about what you do that they don't seem to understand or some i mean some of them i'm sure get it but some of them don't so is there anything that you get to on a daily basis you think wow i just i wish they were just understood this part of my business that's it's not a tough one but there's so many things i wish they would understand so many things uh one of the first things that you'll notice when you go mobile so so let's try. what's that sam yeah, go ahead. I was going to say one of the first things that you'll notice when you go. I said go mobile. ahead. Okay. When you show up to a shop, probably seven times out of ten, eight times out of ten, you're going to have a dead battery in the vehicle. And if you're programming a vehicle or you're doing any type of diagnostics, you need a fresh, strong battery. And that's one of the biggest things you're going to run into is for whatever reason, the battery is of little to no concern of the shop. And a lot of times, a lot of their root causes are from the dead battery. Um, so, yeah, probably give me a fresh, strong battery to start off with, and I'd be a lot happier. So, so uh, a couple of things, you know, I've been doing this for 10 years, mobile. And one of the things that, I, that always bugs me when I go to a shop is... Uh, they don't seem to understand I have a schedule. And I don't know a better way to put it other than they don't understand that, you know, I'm I'm showing up. I got a time sch schedule for this job, and I, and I got to move on to the next one. And lots of times I'll get to a shop and they'll say, well, can you do your next job and come back? And I'm, that's not how this works. You know, if I co have to come back, it's going to be tomorrow. <laughs> It's a good point. It's a very good point. I run into that all the time. And and a lot of guys might want to, you know, I'm getting ready to tell you that when you show up, they'll say, oh, Sam, uh, while you're here, I have two other vehicles for you. And on the surface, that sounds great. You're thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, I can make uh, more money on two additional jobs. But then you got to remember that you have multiple jobs after that already and taking those two jobs you know, let's just say they're 30 minutes a piece and that's on the good end. So now you're going to be an hour to an hour and 15 minutes behind if you're lucky and if everything runs smooth. And so what do you do? You neglect the the people that you already have scheduled. That's not fair. So, yeah, that, they have tunnel vision. Um, they don't realize that you have multiple customers. And quite honestly, I've had to tell many of the shops, you're not my only customer. And it might sound abrupt. It might sound rude, but sometimes that's the only way you'll get their attention is to let them know that they're not yeah. the only one. 
Yeah, I had, um, I don't have as much trouble with it as I used to, where you show up and they want you to do multiple jobs. And, um, and I'm not, you know, I set up my schedule pretty tight and I got two guys working for me. So we, I, we run a pretty tight schedule. Um, it's not as bad having two extra guys because, you know, my goal is to try to have everybody back done working by three o'clock. It almost never happens, but that's my right. goal when I put the day together. Um, that, and the other thing I kind of wish that shops understood is that I'm not the guy from the dealership that's running down on his lunch hour to program a car. We, I'm running a business, you know, and, it, and I, ha I have a little bus that's full of equipment to do programming, to try to do the best job I can for the shops which gives me capabilities the dealers don't have but at least as good as the dealership has and they don't understand that that comes with a cost they'll say well i can run it down to the or my you know my guy from the gm dealer will run down here and do that for half that price at lunchtime and that's not you know that's not comparing apples to apples it's not it's definitely not and also those guys that are moonlighting on at lunchtime or after work to them, there's no repercussions, so they don't take it as serious. This is our livelihood. This is our profession. This is what we do. So when I go to a job site, I take somewhat of an ownership of the vehicle and of the job I'm doing. If you're just zipping over there at lunchtime and you're using the dealer login and you're just you know throwing some software on the module real quick, you really don't care if it works or not because then you just go back to your regular job. Well, if we do something and it doesn't work out, well, now we're on the hook and we have to figure it out and stay there until it's figured out. Yeah. And then, then the other thing that I, I wanted to bring up is that, you know, we see uh, more and more of these companies sending shops, these quote unquote, I'll put my quotes and my air quotes up, um, pre-programmed computers. Uh, uh. And, and to me, they're a thorn in my side and not, not not necessarily because they're taking work away. You know, everybody thinks I don't like them because they're taking work away from me. And no. it's the complete opposite because they're taking, they're making my job that much harder when I get there. Cause now I got to figure out what they've done to fix what their prop, the shop's problem is. And a lot of times it's the wrong calibration. It's the wrong VIN number. They fat fingered two of the numbers in the VIN. It, which sounds like it'd be easy to fix, but it's not always easy to fix. No. And um, a lot of these companies are misinforming the shop of what's required. I, I can't tell you the number of times that I'll be handed a module and said, and they'll say, yep, it's all set. All you have to do is they said, just learn the security or just plug it in, make sure everything's right, Sam. And then when I go out there, it's way more than that. So, yeah, it's, I just wish they would, these these uh, module companies would just inform the shops better of what's actually required of the programmer. Yeah, I think on paper or on the desk, it looks good, you know, to these mobile, pro to these programming company or module companies. I think they think that it's going to be a plug and play when they get there. I don't think they're being uh, dishonest about it, but the reality is, they're not doing a good job. It's true. It's very true. Yeah. And um, uh, I and think I, the other thing. I go was going to say um, another thing is how they prepare for us, how the shops prepare for us and the location in which they put the vehicle. So if you're working on a European vehicle, you're going to need to be close to the ethernet and, Many of the shops, after you become a regular, they realize, okay, he's doing a BMW. He's going to need access to the Ethernet. Well, don't forget that you have to put me, you know, at least 50 to 100 feet within range of the, of the building. Because if you don't, then we're going to have a problem. Sometimes the vehicle is trapped in two or three rows of vehicles and you can't get to it. So having the, if you know, we talked about this before. If you show up to a shop and you pull up next to the vehicle and there's a maintainer on it and it's right next to the bay and it's clean and you can access it. And 
you're just like, wow, this is amazing. This is what I want. But 99.9% .9 of the time, it's never like that. Yeah. Well, the other, the other thing, and you may be different, is when I show up to a shop, I almost prefer it to be outside. And, uh, and it really doesn't matter to be the weather because I can get in and out of the doors easier. I can get underneath the hood easier. If there is an extension cord out to the car under to be underneath the hood and I could open all the doors, the trunk, you know, whatever I needed to get into with ease, I would, I would prefer it be outside. It's a good point. Yeah. You definitely stay out of their way and you definitely stay out of their range of questions because for whatever reason, the technician's going to come over and they're going to be curious and they're have a lot of questions and yeah, you can just go out there, yeah, isolate and do your job. Yeah. I don't mind so much the questions as it is a lot of times it's on a hoist. You can't get the door open. Mm. And then if you get the hoist are close together, so you got to walk around two bays to get back to the front of the car and then walk back around the two bays to get back to the, to the driver's door. Uh, and I like, I like doing a pre-scan of the car uh, before I start programming it, just to make sure everything communicates. And I think it'd be good if, if the shop would take the module out of the box, plug it into the car, and at least make sure that it communicates. And if it doesn't, inform us before we get there. You know, it might be one of those few modules that needs to be programmed to communicate. Then at least if we know before we get there that, hey, that doesn't talk to my scanner, my I can't pull codes from it, I could say, okay, yeah, experience tells me I'm not worried about that one. Um, but if otherwise, you know, it's a PCM and a, let's just say a 13 Malibu, we all know that needs to communicate before we can program it. So if it doesn't communicate, I'm taking you off my schedule. I'll see you tomorrow. Fix it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't think no. they have, I don't, the, the pre-scan is an awesome idea, but I don't think they, a lot of times they're not interested in, in knowing what should communicate, what shouldn't. Um, they, once they get their mindset that we're replacing this module, that's all they're focused on. This is the module. This is what I want you to replace. And at that point they're done until we get there. Uh, but I'm with you. I wish they do a pre-scan and that would, and it would help them understand as well that if, if they have a no com to the PCM with the original and then they replace it and they still have a no com, well, they might want to, you know, excuse the, the terminology, but, you know, pump the brakes and go reevaluate the diagnosis because it's pro probable that that's not the issue. The module is not the issue. Yeah. It would help them. It would help yeah. them learn and understand what, what we see. Um, by doing those steps. Yeah, that's correct. And then we're seeing that this rash of, uh, hold on a second, I'm gonna, I'm gonna re-situate myself. Okay. All right, my knee was getting cramped. Um, so we're seeing us start to see a whole bunch of these different remote programming companies. Are you seeing, seeing those where they're being a problem? Um, I don't want to use the word problem. Uh, again, okay, the company, I will. But they're problems. The the companies, the companies are again misinforming by omitting information. They're not telling them the full capability of the tools that they're investing in. They're not explaining the full capability of what the remote service can cover. So again, they're misled. That's just that's just my thought. Yeah, I think the the biggest thing is they're not telling them the limitations of what they can do remotely. Hundred percent. Yep. So, and it, and there's there is limitations to it, and there and to me, and maybe you maybe I maybe have a different approach, but to me, they can do the easy jobs. It's the stuff that takes some thought, takes some bandwidth, takes some connectivity um, with the OE tools, stuff like that. That's the stuff they're struggling with, in my opinion. Correct. No, I second that opinion. You know, you're, you're spot on. It's not, it's not that 
the easy stuff that they have trouble with. It's the, and it's, I'm not going to say it's the hard stuff. It's just the stuff that requires the OE tool um, or a, just a different understanding of what's going to happen. I will say, and I, you I know, the shops, a, go ahead. I was going to say, I'll, I, I was going to give you an example. And it, I had a, a shop a week ago that had, a, they got a remote programmer and I'm not going to say which one they got, but they got a remote programmer and they were trying to put a used computer in a Saab uh, 9.3. And uh, I'm not saying it can't be done with a remote programmer, but uh, the guy at the other end of the remote programming has to have a certain level of understanding of what he's doing and equipment that he's using. And I'm not going to get into details. I did do a video on the Saab how I did it. Okay. So, I'll have to check that out. So. But it was kind of interesting because it was a... Uh, That's definitely your a, territory. Uh, Sobs are definitely your territory. I try to stay away. Yeah, I don't I have to the stop card. Yeah, I used to do a lot of them. I don't do... I still do a few. Uh, and I've learned a few tricks of the trade over the, over the years of doing them. And... Uh, I can knock one out pretty fast uh, if it, if everything if everything is proper with the with the car. I can knock one out pretty fast. The nine three and the nine five. I do more nine threes than I do nine fives. And then uh, we all know the nine seven is just a, just the trailblazer. And you almost always got to call GM <laughs> on the nine. So I don't know if you do any nine seven. I've not, ne but. I've never done a nine seven. Yeah, you do it like a trailblazer. Okay. Uh, but there, it's almost, you know, how you do the car and it shows that it's missing the calibrations. So you got to call tech support and have it built. Yes. That's how it'll be with the Saab 97. Oh, okay. Unless, unless somebody's programmed it before. <laughs> so they're going to have to send you a special VCI programming. Uh, typically with the 97s, they just load the car. They just and they tell you to be ready in an hour or, or something. Oh, okay, that's cool. So, um, anything else you see in your day-to-day -day challenges with being mobile that, um, you, that you think would be an easy fix somehow? <laughs> on the end of the shop or on my end as I travel? Either one. Um, I, know, I know I keep joking that... I, want, I need to buy a helicopter. It's the only way I'm going to get to all these places. Right. Um, time management, and I don't, I don't know if there's an answer, but trying to, to buckle down on your time management is key. And I have noticed that even if you're really strict on your time management, you're going to come across something that just, you know, maybe you anticipate it's going to take 55 minutes or an hour and 10 minutes. And next thing you know, you have lag and you're sitting at the same location for an hour and 50 minutes. And well, there goes the day. So time management is key. Yeah. Uh, you can increase time management by, sound like a broken record, by having a bigger vehicle. Because then you could be more efficient by having more equipment on the run. Um, today was a time management issue for me. It's it's in the evening and I'm still in my car and that's that's why we're doing this video from my location and, we're, and how we're doing it. Um, sometimes you get done at 2.30, 3 o'clock. Sometimes you get done at, at 7.30, 8.30. I will say this. When I worked in the shop, I had no problem coming in early, staying late, and I didn't even have to be told to. That was just something that I did. If we opened up at 8 a.m., I was there 6.45, 7 a.m., I'm, you know, grinding, I'm turning wrenches, I'm doing my thing, no problem. They close at five. Sam, you going to stay? Yeah, I'm going to stay. I'll be here for a little while. I got the key, no worries, and I would just stay. And I thought, wow, I'm really giving my, uh, a lot of myself to the industry, you know, a lot of myself to the shop. Well, that was nothing. Because when you are mobile, it seems never ending. doesn't matter if you wake up at, and, and leave at 6.30 a.m., your days, it feels like my day is never done. So even if I get home at 6.30, I might have to do research for the next day. 
or I might have to go online and, and purchase a tool because I have a job next week and it's another tool that I found out that I needed at last minute. Um, so, well, that's a never ending thing with the tools. Yeah. So time management, um, there, there's no surefire way to manage your time, but if someone gets into this business, I just focus on time management and, and don't be the type of person that's going to say yes to everything unless you don't mind working until 11 PM, 1 AM. If you want to do that, fine. Say yes to everything and say, I can have it done today. I can have it done tomorrow, but be realistic to yourself. Um, because by the time Thursday comes, you're going to, it's going to feel like Saturday night and yeah, just time management. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I had a guy ask me the other day if I was to, uh, if I was to start over, what would I do different? And, uh, and I don't know. It's, it's one of those things, you know, it's, I've told lots of people that we started the programming stuff by, I, I say accident, but really it was, wasn't by accident. We, we kind of ran with it once it started, you know, it's, it, they, somebody threw the ball to me and, we took off running and said, let's, let's do it. You know, we didn't resist it when it started. And, uh, and I pretty much started the programming business because my son was 18 and he needed a job. So it worked out. I wanted to focus, focus on the equipment sales. Yeah. I started him with a J box, a laptop and a maintainer. So and that boy has this grown since then. Indeed, He's driving a uh, three-quarter ton extended van, and I'm driving a school bus. <laughs> so. I heard um, one time a, a mobile programmer said, "Every time I go," to, he says, "Every time I go to a job, I look at it as I'm either going to be programming that vehicle or diagnosing that vehicle." I think that's a really good thought process because a lot of times you're going to go there for a programming job and you're going to find out right away that it's not about programming. It's about a circuit issue and you have yeah. one or two options. I mean, you, you're there already. You got to be there anyway. If your time hits and you're into the diagnostic portion of it, then you just let them know, Hey, this is what's going on. Since I'm here already, I'll diagnose it for you. Um, and then you move on from there. But I thought that was a great way to look at it. Either way, you're going to the job. You're going to be doing one of two things, either programming or diagnosing. Just mentally be prepared. And that's that's really how it goes. Yeah. Yeah, I was at a, a shop today. I did a diag today and I didn't get it didn't get it quite done. Um I had to call it, I had to go do something else, but I didn't quite get it done. And it was looking like I had it narrowed down to either underhood fuse box or body control module. So I kind of, uh, before we did anything else, and I, I really think it's going to end up being an underhood fuse box type problem. So it's going to be Is a it General Motors? To, the, to the BCM. Is it General Motors? Yeah, it was a 06 or 07. Impala, yeah. Yeah, the Impala with the fuse box underneath the hood right there by the battery. Okay, yeah. So, the one that never has a problem, right? <laughs> That's why I was wondering if it was a GM. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's... Um, I think that's what they're going to end up with is putting a fuse box underneath the hood. But like I say, I had another call I had to go go take care of. And that's the, one of the other challenges, you know, you always got something else that I had a job earlier in the day that the customer called and I had, had forgotten to do a stop. And that's what it came to, kind of came down to was that I forgot to do a last step. I had to go take care of that. So, and it does you know, happen. I, it does happen. And, and I, when I tell people that, cause I try to be on top of my game, but I guess the reality is I'm only human. And uh, I've told people, uh, I said, man, I can't believe you. I talk to my wife, I talk to a family member, and I'll say, 
can't believe it. I, I have my schedule all mapped out and I forgot to go to one location. I say, how do you forget to go to a location? I said, you, you know, <laughs> I said, I would have never, I, I would be exactly like you and say, how do you forget that? What's wrong with you? But for whatever reason, it happens. We become so overwhelmed with, you know, calls and, you know, I could, I'm taking a call like this. I'm looking on the, the laptop at service information while something's programming. It's, it can be overwhelming. And that's why I just, re, I reinforce time management, stay focused on the job, time management. Um, but it's really easy to get overwhelmed. Yeah. Let's well, we're at our kind of at our limit. What I'd like to do with these podcasts for 30 minutes. So, um, you got anything you want to add? Anything we didn't cover? Something you think we should? Um, there's so there's so much we could cover. I, I'll tell you what, if the, if this podcast works out, um, let's do another one, and maybe we can direct it more to, towards the uh, programmer, and maybe give them some insight on what they might need to get their get their business going. And then um, in the interim, we can also. Uh, I could put something together. Maybe we can talk about what might help the shop owners who are watching to better prepare for us. I know we mentioned um, a fresh battery, um, good location. You said you don't mind being outside. Um, yeah, I guess for now we're we're doing pretty well. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for being a guest on my podcast, and uh, we'll talk later. Awesome. Thank you.